And we published a document of the same name. I'm a co-author with Dr. Sasha Heath and Dr. Sarah Cross. Wild Farm Alliance promotes a healthy, viable agriculture that protects and restores wild nature. Oh, and I wanted to say, if you uh, would like to get a copy of this document, you can go to our website at wildfarmalliance.org. So today I'm gonna to be covering which birds are insectivores, carnivores, and omnivores, what kinds of pest control services are provided by birds, how you can manage pest birds, what are the habitat, water, and safety needs of birds, and how you can design a farm based on birds foraging strategies. So one of the key things to take away from this talk, if nothing else, is that the overwhelming majority of songbirds are beneficial during nesting season because they eat insects and they feed insects to their young. So even birds like this female brewer's blackbird, whose um, beak is full of insects and feeds, it, um, feeds those insects to its young in the spring, um, it, they, that bird may be a pest later, but we wanna support those, these birds when they are good, when they are helping the farm. And, and nature's a little messy like that. Um, there's never really a black and white uh, scenarios in nature as, as all farmers know. So, um, but there are some general ways. Predominantly, um, uh, we have categorized uh, uh, in insectivores as predominantly eating insects um, and carnivores as predominantly eating uh, rodents and, and pest birds. And um, we wanna encourage these birds year round. So who are those birds? Well. Um, uh, the, the, this uh, hand or that sheet um, and these lists are in our bird booklet. You can uh, go to them to see more. But um, just to give you some examples, the astrotid flycatcher is an insectivore, and farmers like um, this this farm uh, put in a, a bird box uh, to attract them. Um, and then there's other kinds of birds like swallows. Cliff swallows specifically live under the eaves of uh, buildings. And so we want to um, ensure that they, that they can um, live there if, if they're not um, leaving uh, feces on, on anything important. I mean, uh, as in uh, something that would get contaminated. So there's also insectivores that need habitat. They build woven nests on, um, on vegetation, and that's like bush tits and yellow warblers. Then carnivores, sometimes we can support them with man-made structures like these great blue herons, which will eat rodents, and uh, barn owls, which um, eat rodents too, and you're going to hear a lot more about them. Barn owls need boxes. And then there's also carnivores that um, need vegetation. And then here we have omnivores and granivores, which we really need to practice coexistence with these birds. They, as I said, they are predominantly um, beneficial during the nesting season, but we need to possibly keep them out of the crop during harvest. So that's everything from um, quail and crows and mockingbirds, starlings sparrows, blackbirds. This is a Sarah Cross slide. It is showing how avian pest control studies have occurred uh, in these crops all around the world. And avian pest control actually started in our country in the 1880s when they uh, first um, um, developed or, or created this division of economic ornithology. And for the next 50 years, between seven and 800 papers were published on this topic. And this is just one of them. And then DDT happened and the interest in biological um, decreased or biological control. And, and, but there's been a resurgence in the last 20 or so years. And um, in the appendix of our bird booklet, 
we have, <laughs> excuse me, we've document, <coughs> sorry, we've documented almost 120 studies of, of avian pest control. Everything uh, um, and, uh, that has to do with fruit, including wine grapes to um, vegetables to um, pastures and, and, and uh, other situations like where there's raptors and, and how to attract them. So of those 120 studies, 90% of them showed that birds were beneficial at, at, at some point for the crops. So um, birds are in decline in North America. Over 3 billion birds um, declined since the ninth excuse me, the 1970s. <clears throat> and um, uh, so hopefully growers like you can help turn this around. And uh, if we look up here in wetlands, it's interesting to note that they are actually, all the wetland birds are, are increasing. And that has to do with over the last um, probably 40 years, there's been a huge effort to restore wetlands and, and the birds are responding to that. So um, we need to um, give birds more room so they can also help with pest control. And uh, as um, many of you probably know, there's an insect apocalypse occurring um, and uh, birds eat insects. So, um, we need to, you know, as we um, make things more safe and um, and and more habitat available for um, for uh, birds, we're going to be helping the insects too. They're all tied together. This is Dr. Julie Jedlicka. She did some really cool um, blue Western bluebird research in vineyards in Napa County. Three different kinds of studies. First, she put up bluebird boxes in the vineyards and she found that when the boxes were there, the bluebirds increased 10 times. Then she took some experimental live cat and pinned them to different spots all around the vineyards and, um, and some were close to the the, to the boxes. And uh, those were eaten on an average of two and a half times more um, when they were near the boxes. So then she was interested in finding out, well, what exactly are they eating out there in the vineyards? And to, to, um, growers were interested in the blue-green sharpshooter, which is a kind of leaf hopper. And um, that, <clears throat> that year, she also tracked, well, how many blue-green sharpshooters are in the, the vineyards? And, and it was a really low year for them. So she didn't see, find that the bluebirds were eating them, but she found that they were eating a close cousin, the sage leafhopper. And so she theorizes that um, uh, supporting bluebirds, um, you're going to have a decrease in, in um, sharpshooters. So um, how do you, what, what's the great, uh, what are the directions for putting up bluebird boxes? Well, I'm gonna um, send you to a, a website a little later about that. But um, in general, bluebird boxes should be around 200 feet apart. They should be four to five feet in height and uh, they should not be facing um, south because they'll get too hot. Um, they also should be cleaned out once a year by say um, the end of the year. And um, sometimes uh, tree swallows will move in to the um, bird boxes. These tree swallows are insectivores. So that's a good thing. Um, now, what I wanna do is share with you some other kinds of avian pest control research We'll get back to vineyards in a bit, but I wanted to give you like a broader understanding or, or just concept that birds are helpful in all kinds of agriculture. So I um, did my uh, master's research looking at birds eating codly moth in apple orchards and others have done their studies across the world in temperate agriculture and have found um, 
everywhere from 13 to 99 percent of the overwintering codling moth, which is the the worm and the apple, um, are eaten um, by birds. And I found around an average of 80 <clears throat> percent. Uh, Dr. Sasha Heath, one of our co-authors, studied uh, birds eating codling moth and walnuts because they will um, damage walnuts, and she found an average of 35 percent of the um, of the overwintering codling moth were consumed by birds. Birds, birds like um, white-breasted nuthatch and nettles woodpeckers. <clears throat> this is Dr. Matt Johnson. He is in Humboldt State University. Uh, and he, for the last, um, I want to say five years, has been working with grad students to study barn owls. And this handout, which you can find on their Facebook page, um, uh, the documents or describes some of the things that they have documented. For instance, uh, two adults and four nestings will kill a thousand rodents in a nesting season. And so he um, uh, figured out that, you know, if you have 20 nesting boxes, you could have, you know, as much as two to 20,000 rodents killed. But more recently, they extrapolated, <coughs> excuse me, that data and said that if those same um, six barn owls um, were on your farm year round, they would eat 3,500 rodents in a year. So that's quite a bit of service for just putting up a nest box. Um, they also found that the birds were in the vineyard hunting about a third of the time. They valued other kinds of habitat like grassland, oak savanna, and riparian mostly. Um, so uh, it just makes it more uh, um, easier for them to find that prey they need to raise their family. Uh, but in cases, there are cases I know in um, the Central Valley of California, lots and lots of farmers are putting in barn owl boxes and their habitat isn't there, this um, native habitat, but what is there is, open country, like lots of vineyards and, 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 um, and, and these are open country birds. So they don't, um, they don't typically like to be um, in wooded areas. They like um, open areas. They think that in part it has to do with um, when they're flying into the box, they want it open. And they also, we also know that, um, Great horned owls are predators of barn owls and they are woodland birds. So again, um, the barn owls strategy is, is open country. And this is um, more of uh, what um, Humboldt State had came up with was um, the mix of, of who they're eating. They're eating lots of voles and mice and some gophers and then other miscellaneous rodents. And what they found, at least for Napa, um, is that barn owls will use, are, are, are more likely to use nest boxes when they're made of wood. They're at least three meters off the ground. They face north or east, so again, not south. And they're placed within a half mile of grasslands, riparian, or mixed forest. Um, I'm gonna come back to this three meters, which is about 10 feet. And, um, you know, in the past, growers have put these boxes up much higher, but we're finding that this is high enough and really high boxes are hard to, um, to clean out. So the, you know, just making them 10 feet and, and even making, putting them um, next to a dirt road where you could pull your truck up and get in the back of the pickup to stand on it. Um, to help clean, to reach that and clean it out um, is a good strategy. Also, you don't want to put barn owl boxes or any kind of nest boxes, bluebird boxes or other boxes um, next to busy roads. Uh, so often we see that um, these birds will get hit by traffic. Plus they, you know, they, they like a nice place to live. They don't really 
um, gravitate towards um, really noisy um, um, places or, or, or busy places where, where people are a lot. So um, this is a website for our webpage from Cornell's Nest Watch program, and it shows a black capped chickadee, but actually there's um, for every um, bird that you could um, provide a nest box or some kind of nest structure, they have it here on their website. And um, you can download the directions and they tell you how far apart to put them and how high and what direction. And, and so it's a really great resource for um, Nest Watch. Sarah Cross and uh, one of her grad students studied perches because perches can bring in raptors and help with pest control. And um, so what they found, which you know, kind it kind of makes sense. Um, uh, the raptors like the perches on the top of the hill as opposed to in a valley because on on the top they're going to be able to see better, and they also are going to use a perch much more often if it's away from trees, because if there's trees, they're gonna use the trees. And they found that it's uh, the birds um, uh, will use 15 foot poles and probably a little bit more than 20 foot poles. So um, make it easy on yourself and um, 15 feet is high enough. I threw this slide in here. It's not about vineyards, but maybe you'll get some idea from it. Um, Peter Martinelli, who's on our board and, and runs uh, or has Fresh Run Farm, was having a problem with um, sparrows eating his, um, it was brassica plants. And so he had an irrigation line out in his field. He unscrewed the sprinkler heads and screwed on these PVC tees. And he had the scene at Cooper's Hawk in the area. And that Cooper's Hawk keyed in on these uh, perches right away. And um, he ended up having a good crop after all. So other kinds of study, this is a study um, is about, with strawberries. And what the researchers found is that when strawberries are big, huge monocultures, um, there's a lot of birds that are eating the strawberries. And even insectivores sometimes were found with strawberries on their beaks. And they think that it's happening because there's really nothing else for them to eat. Um, and they found that when farms were diverse and uh, growing lots of different things and or had diverse uh, with, with uh, and served or planted habitat and or were surrounded by um, habitat, they um, that damage uh, really, really decreased. And so um, monocultures, yeah, monocultures kind of um, encourage uh, damage. Uh, this is in almonds, and I'm throwing this in here because I think it's a it's an interesting concept you may see in grapes too, where um, the researchers were looking at how, what the birds were eating and when, and it turns out yes, they will eat some almonds before harvest, but they come in afterwards and eat the mummies. And these almond growers have to go in either manually or mechanically and remove all those almonds because they'll be, um, uh, you know, carry diseases and pest insects into the next crop. And um, so while you all probably harvest all of your grapes, um, but if, if there are mummies, I would bet you that there are some birds going in to clean them up. So a few years back, um, a study was looking at pest birds and who's, at least in California for wine grapes, European starlings, American robins, and wild turkeys were, were the worst. Um, this was a, a grower survey. So how, what do we do? What do we do when we need to defer, deter um, pest birds? There's, there's um, techniques that are visual, sound, exclusion. There's perches, 
um, which I just talked about, and nest boxes, there's falconry, and there's lethal means. So visually, you could have a plastic um, a statue of a hawk. You could use scare tape. If you use scare tape, only have it up when the birds are a problem, not year round. You don't want to scare them when they're nesting and helping you with pests. Um, there's these uh, um, balloons, scare balloons. There's also down here was a study on drones and researchers found that the drone that looked like a bird scared the birds much better than other kinds, other shapes. But they also said that it takes a lot of people hours to um, run those. And uh, because as soon as they're not up there, the birds are back. Um, and then there's lasers. And I think the verdict is still out whether lasers are safe for birds, we know they can be effective, but in some other situations, we also know that lasers have really harmed the eyes of birds so much so that they can't forage later. And um, with birds in decline, we really want things to be safer for birds. Also, um, the manufacturers will tell uh, the grower, don't go out there, um, in the field when it's on because it'll hurt your eyes and don't put your livestock out there because it'll hurt their eyes. So, but we're hoping that there is gonna be more research with lasers so that we can, researchers can help to fine tune um, uh, what levels could be safe for birds and still be effective for growers. There's sound, um, sound cannons, there's distress calls and predator calls, and I've seen that they can work really well, um, especially if the grower moves that around. Um, and this, uh, this little gadget actually recognizes the bird's calls that are on your farm and then responds and will do everything from blowing up um, one of these movable uh, scarecrows to um, inflatable scarecrows to um, sound. People are getting creative. Obviously there's exclusion, but it can be really expensive um, both to purchase and to install. I know there's some netting that you can leave on, you pull up and down uh, like a sock sort of. Um, uh, and the thing about netting is you want to make sure that the birds aren't caught inside. Sarah Cross, um, one of our co-authors, uh, got her PhD in New Zealand um, looking at New Zealand falcons. It turns out that the, um, the vineyard land and farmland had taken over the falcons territory and they were, they were becoming um, really rare. So conservationists started to bring them back down into the lower country and um, Sarah worked with them to bring them in to vineyards and they were so successful that um, the, the growers were, um, you know, really want to, I don't know if begging is the right word, but they were asking uh, for um, falcons to be released in in their vineyards because of the savings uh, was somewhere between two and three hundred dollars per hectare for different grape varietals. Um, we here in the U.S. have lots of different falcons and um, birds of prey, whereas in New Zealand they don't. So we're lucky. We just need to track them. Now this is uh, American Kestrel's story. It's about how in Michigan. Researchers are looking at putting um, kestrel boxes in. Then in the spring, when that kestrels nest, the cherries are ripe, whereas grapes are ripe in the fall. But still, if you were to bring attract um, kestrels to your uh, farm, they likely will stay around um, in the area and help with pest control later. And what was interesting about these birds is they eat mostly rodents, small rodents, bulls and mice, but they scare the heck out of pest birds. And so we're saving uh, growers millions of dollars, or it's estimated that they would save them. And this was an interesting hinged poll 
because kestrel boxes need to be up pretty high that you could, um, uh, it's a little more expensive to make a hinge full, but it is um, easier to clean out that box, which um, can be really important. The thing about not cleaning out boxes that is bad for the birds is that um, over time that the, the um, whether, you know, it's a bluebird box where they're building, they're bringing in a grass nest and building it inside, or it's a barn owl box, or these guys that are um, leaving uh, rodent parts in there and it builds up and it builds up. And pretty soon it gets so high that it's close to the top of that uh, entrance hole. And it makes it really easy for nestlings that are right close to the entrance hole then to be grabbed by predators. So cleaning out the boxes is super important. Falconry can work um, for sure. And um, I, it, it can be expensive. Sometimes uh, growers like Louis, Louise Ingle will um, become a licensed falconer. You have to have a license in order to use these birds um, to deter um, pest birds and vineyards. But I do know of cases where small vineyards will uh, join together to hire a falconer to fly um, in their in their uh, bigger area and become cost effective. <clears throat> the Migratory Bird Treaty Act protects migratory birds. There are some um, exceptions and and caveats. Um, for instance, there's a couple of native bird, or non-native birds in our um, in the U.S. that um, we could uh, growers can um, um, kill without any permit, and that's European starlings and house sparrows. Then um, there are, <laughs> excuse me, <clears throat> there are some exceptions where you can kill these other. Blackbirds, crows, grackles, and black-billed magpies, but you need to have um, uh, a system where you, when you're when you're trapping them uh, before you kill them, that they are um, not uh, overheating. A as an example, there's a bunch of uh, caveats, and um, and you have to fill uh, fill out and send in reports, and um, and then in California, there's some. Uh, further birds uh, with, with uh, exceptions um, with caveats. So, you know, some growers ask, why not remove all habitat? Uh, because don't birds use um, habitat to perch? Um, but if you consider that the birds like starlings that have these huge flocks, uh, if they're flying through the landscape and they know that your big block of grapes is ripe, they're going for that. They're not going to just, so down here, I have a picture of um, a landscape and this is actually a big hedgerow where the star is. But if you're that flock of birds, you're not going to be keying in on this hedgerow. You're going to be keying in on big oud. So, um, and then also this big flock is not going to sleep here in this little hedgerow at night. They're, if it, they may, if there's a wetland nearby or some natural habitat, they, they may fly um, miles away um, uh, to find shelter. So, um, you know, localized habitat on your farm um, is a good thing for lots of different birds and, uh, and, and is, isn't really a, a big determining factor for pest bird presence. <clears throat> it's interesting to think about birds and how they help you uh, depending on where, um, where their food source is. So there's, um, birds that are in the air um, and uh, capturing pest insects and, and birds, or, and there's birds that are foraging on, on trees and there's birds down in bushes and low growing uh, plants and or vineyards and looking on the ground for pests. So aerial insectivores like, um, remember I, I mentioned cliff swallows, you can support them uh, under, <coughs> excuse me, under the eaves 
of buildings. Um, tree swallows and violet green swallows eat, or I mean, use the um, nest boxes, the same nest box as uh, bluebirds, and they're great to have around. And then barn swallows uh, build nests in barns, but all of these are aerial foragers. Then there's falcons that are in and kestrels that will capture um, birds uh, in the air. They're really fast. And then there's um, birds that are looking for prey on the grounds like uh, barn owls and like golden eagles, <clears throat> like bluebirds. And then there's the, uh, the birds that are uh, foraging in trees, whether it's chickadees or warblers, or remember we uh, saw earlier um, nuthatches and woodpeckers. So you can design your farm to make the most of bird foraging strategies. And I've been on a farm, probably several farms that have all of these kinds of birds um, because they're providing different kinds of habitat for them. So why not? Why not have all these birds working with you? If you don't know much about birds, this is a really cool um, app you can download for free. Merlin, it's part of Cornell Lab Ornithology. Um, and it's uh, a lovely way to learn about birds. They, they ask you simple questions. Is a bird, the color, um, where was it on the ground and so forth. <clears throat> This is another Cornell website that's really great. If you want to learn about, say, bluebirds, you can learn what they sound like. You can learn where they live. You can, um, uh, yeah, learn all about what they eat. And um, yeah, it's another great website. And then the third website from Cornell can help you determine if, in fact, you want to attract birds in your, uh, or you, you, <laughs> if birds that you want to attract actually live in your area. So um, you go to eBird, and then um, and then you go to Explore, and then you go to Species Map, and. Uh, I put in Western Bluebird for my area. This is down in Santa Cruz, California. And all the blue means that they have, this is citizen science. People have, um, have uh, reported seeing bluebirds here. And the red spots are hot spots where there's a lot of bluebirds. So birds need nesting habitat, which we talked about. They need cover habitat, water sources, and they need safe farm fields. <clears throat> so, you know, um, before we people started um, changing native habitat, there was lots of cavities that um, tree swallows and bluebirds could use. These were made by um, woodpeckers, but now providing nest boxes um, is in high, or, or, um, the birds, uh, really like, and um, not just tree swallows and bluebirds, but these birds too, <clears throat> chickadees, tip mice, flycatcher, uh, violet green swallow, a couple of wrens and the nuthatch all can be um, supported with nasa boxes. Uh, birds also uh, need recover, uh, to hunt from. And um, in this experiment, hedgerows helped to uh, support birds that were going out into, <clears throat> excuse me, into kale fields and um, eating pest insects. And they were eating more closer to the hedgerows. With this study, they showed that just, this is another Sarah Cross study, that if there's just two trees, um, next to alfalfa field, <clears throat> it increases bird species significantly. And she found that birds help reduce pest insects in alfalfa by over 33%. So having vegetative habitat is a 
and putting in hedgerows is a good way to um, bring that habitat to your farm if you don't have it. And um, hedgerows and farmscaping for California agriculture. I know it's California, but we have a lot of the same plants as um, the Northwest and, um, and there's lots of information in there on, on uh, how, you know, what are the best things to do in order to have a successful hedgerows and other farmscaping. So repairing habitat is um, really important. If you have that on your farm, conserve it, restore it. Could be ditches and canal banks, or it could be natural creeks and streams. These two websites, this is National Wildlife Federation and Audubon's Native Plant websites. You can look up native plants <clears throat> that um, would be good to put in your put on your farm here, and they support birds. And um, they're looking at all kinds of different factors. And one of the really important factors is that uh, they supporting a lot of caterpillars. Caterpillars are really easy for birds to eat and uh, feed to their, their soft body, to, easy to feed to their young <clears throat> oak trees, for instance, back on the East Coast support over 500 species. Um, I think in California, it's only 200 species, but still that's a lot. You can see willows have a lot, cherry and so forth. And um, this study was by, done by Doug Tallamy and his students over at University of Delaware <clears throat> that um, what birds eat and 16 out of 20 bird families are eating lots of caterpillars. That's the green uh, bar in these charts. So um, just to give you an idea, this is a chickadee in a, a willow forest. And uh, I took this shot. He's, uh, um, we are categorizing um, uh, the value of plants based on are there very many caterpillars or many or just some and willows have very many. This ocean spray bush has many caterpillars as this orange crown warbler is finding out. But the bladder pod bush just has some caterpillars. So it's not to say that we don't wanna put in the ones uh, that just have some, but we wanna make sure we have the ones that have a lot. Um, tree swallow here is eating uh, wax myrtle berries that fruits four seasons. That's another thing we wanna think about is um, a, when a plant fruits, um, is that fruit available all, all year or just you know a month or um, like these honey, honeysuckle berries are available in three seasons and um, dogwood berries are available in two seasons. Um, Pinstemon flowers, three seasons. Oregon grape flowers, two seasons. Cleveland sage, two seasons. Um, another thing to think about with habitat is uh, who are you gonna support? Like having big trees um, would support uh, great horned owlets like these guys here. They, they wanna be in big canopy up, up high. Um, but other birds like red-winged blackbirds uh, nest, this is in a uh, elderberry, so that's mid-story. And then there's other um, smaller birds like Costa's, uh, Costa's hummingbird, which is uh, nesting in understory. But that's not to say that some, I mean, there's definitely a lot of small birds that will nest up high. Um, it just depends. So water is important. Birds need to keep their feathers clean. So um, they bathe. Some birds like cliff swallows and other kinds of swallows, um, barn swallows um, need mud to build nests. Um, sometimes you have a natural uh, area that already provides water or sometimes just leaving a pipe dripping can um, make all the difference for birds. We wanna manage our farms as safely as we can. <clears throat> so we are learning that neonicotinoids are really hard on um, birds and that um, 
some studies have shown that they uh, get disoriented and can't migrate correctly be when they are exposed to neonics. Then a rodenticide bait, <laughs> excuse me, um, it um, can accumulate in a bird's uh, and raptor's bodies and um, especially the second generation kind, which doesn't kill rodents right away. They keep eating it and eating it. And then pretty soon they have this huge bur body burden. And then the, um, then the raptors get, eat that and get it. And uh, it's not good. So a lot of farms have cats. If you have cats, don't put up bird boxes where they're hanging out because the cats are really good hunters. And there's estimates that cats are, are killing billions of birds. If you do have cats and you have nest boxes up, put predator guards around them. Um, this is a picture of, um, this is uh, the edge of my house and we created this little catio and our, our cat is looking at a bird and, and, and meowing there. But in the backyard, all these birds are, are um, enjoying a, a safe place. And so, you know, think about um, where your cats are if you have them and, and try and um, make sure they're safe places if you're gonna be bringing birds in. <clears throat> I mentioned predator guards. Nest Watch has information on how to make predator guards where, where a, it might be a, a baffle um, like this or um, this Noel guard. We have a, a platform called Benefits of Birds on the Farm that you can find by going to our website, wildfarmalliance.org or bit.ly slash beneficial birds. And a few things I want to point out. Well, uh, what I went over today, there's um, many more case studies in um, this tab. This tab right here has farmer success stories, which I'm gonna talk about in a little bit. There's more um, tools and then there's this songbird farm trail, which I'll go over. So we are <clears throat> inviting farmers to get on our songbird farm trail if they put up um, boxes and perches. And um, let me see if I can get this word. Oh, it was too fast. A Western bluebird. Um, so farms like that farm at Blue Heron Farm is on our Songbird Farm Trail and we'd love for you to join us. You can contact us at Wild Farm Alliance. Um, info at wildfarmalliance.org. And I'll show you my um, contact information at the end too. <clears throat> and on the Songbird Farm Trail, we are highlighting um, who those farmers are and what they are doing. Like that's what the blue indicates. And then the yellow is just where agriculture is. This is in California. We do have a few boxes up in Oregon um, on our map and we'd love to add more in the Northwest. So growers can um, use nest boxes, perches, um, support birds uh, under eaves, and um, there's also platforms for um, great horned, great, uh, <laughs> sorry, um, uh, egrets, um, great blue herons, that's what I'm thinking. Um, conserve plant and restore native plant, native habitat, provide water sources, make sure to manage and coexist with pest birds, and take care when there's cats or other predators present and when using pesticides. So I mentioned we have farmer stories um, at our bit.ly slash beneficial birds. You can learn, you can um, go and listen to this four minute video with Ames Morrison, who uh, is at Medlock's Ames Vineyard in Healdsburg, California. And um, we pair growers with a researchers like Brianna Martin Tinko, who's at UC Davis. And um, we also have uh, four other um, avian pest control um, 
videos uh, at Vineyards, Spring Mountain Vineyard, where they have over 800 Bluebird boxes. It's a really cool story. You want to hear that. Um, we uh, featured Trey Saboris Vineyard and then Gergich Vineyard. And, um, and again, we're pairing these, um, these vineyards and growers um, um, stories with um, research to back it up. So they're short and fun to hear about. And this again is our um, website where you can download that bird booklet. And if you want to get a hold of me, here's my contact information. Thank you.